Biscuits. The Jewels of the Trade podcast, encouraging professionals with industry inspiration, gemology, and more. Welcome to the Jewels of the Trade podcast. Today, we have two very special guests on the channel. Kaylin Khoury of Lotus Gemology recently published a game-changing article titled The Hardness of Fei Choi Jade, A Gemological Perspective. And I am a little starstruck and honored to introduce Lotus Gemology's Richard Hughes to the podcast. Mr. Hughes is well known in this industry for his books on ruby and sapphire, which can be found on the shelves of gemologists all over the world, and is extremely famous in the jade world, especially known for his paper, Burmese Jade, The Inscrutable Gem, and his 2022 book, Jade, A Gemologist's Guide. He is widely considered one of the leading experts on jade in the world. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview. My interest in in gemstones started when I was 18 years old, and a friend of mine invited me to uh, travel to Europe after we got out of high school. So we did that, and while I was in Europe, I met somebody who had come from Asia, an Australian, and he had traveled overland across Asia, and he told me about it, and I grew up in Colorado in the U.S., and so I always wanted to see the Himalayas, and I always wanted to go to Nepal. And so I said, well, how much would it cost to, like, go from Europe to Nepal? And he said, maybe uh, $30. And I was just blown away by that. Um, I was spending $10 a day in Europe, Um, But he was actually wrong. It cost me about $25. Anyway, so that's how I started my journey to Asia. Yeah. And it was while traveling through Asia, um, Iran, they had turquoise, Afghanistan, they have lapis lazuli. And uh, especially in India, there are a lot of gems being sold. And then when I got to Burma on that same trip, I saw my first piece of jade. And I was really entranced by it. Uh, of course, that was the Fei Choi Jade that they have. And I, at the time, it, it was just seemed so exotic. And I thought, you know, I'm going to make a career out of this. I'm going to become a jade trader. Well, it didn't work out quite like that. Um, I ended up uh, going to Thailand. I really liked it in Thailand. So I decided to live there. And while I was in Bangkok, I saw an advertisement for a school that was teaching gemology. I went in there, and there was this young lady, very pretty, and she signed me up for the course. I ended up marrying her, um, but that's how I got involved in gemology. And so uh, ever since then, um, I've been involved in gemology. I've always had a strong interest in Fei Choi, but I didn't really know that much about it. And so in Bangkok, the market was all ruby and sapphire, almost 99%. And so that's why I I started writing about ruby and sapphire, because that was the thing that I was exposed to the most. But that's how it got started. Fantastic. And Kaylin, can you tell us about your background? How did you get into gemology and what inspired your incredible article? Well, I've been a gemologist for the past nine years. Um, I worked at a gem lab in South Africa, uh, where I'm from. Um, and my wife and I moved to Thailand uh, recently so I could join the Lotus team. And um, the inspiration behind the article was <laughs> there were questions being raised um, whether umphasad rich Fei Choi Jade should be separated from jadeite rich. Fei Choi Jade because the reported hardnesses in literature were different. So I'm assuming the thought process was the durability was different and it's important to separate the two. Um, so we decided to investigate a bit further into uh, into the material. It's been such a hot topic lately and I'm so glad that you covered it. So one of the topics that we're really going to dive into today is what GIA quaintly termed the jadeite omphasite nomenclature question. But I think before we get into the deep depths of that, we should actually cover the difference between nephrite and jadeite jade. Dick, 
can you give us a brief history on the word jade and how that pesky science keeps uncovering challenges with jade nomenclature? Jade has big problems with nomenclature. <laughs> Uh, uh, we've we put a little sidebar on the article online. Even the wor- even the English word jade itself is wrong. It was a it was a bastardization of a Spanish and then French word. It should have been called ijade or ijade, but somebody didn't know that there are feminine and masculine nouns in in those languages. And so they translated it wrong, and that's how we call the stone jade today. So it, it started out badly and has gotten worse over time. The, the term that they use for, for jade in China is yu, and that's what we in the West call, call nephrite. Um, when they, when the Fei Choi started to come into the mark, into the Chinese market in quantity, during the eight, 17 and eighteen hundreds in the Qing Dynasty, they knew that the material was different, and so they they used an old term that had been applied to a bright green nephrite Fei Choi, and they applied that to the new material. Um, and so the, the term Fei Choi had been used for that material long before Damore first got his hands on jade. Further to that point, um, nephrite or, or yu in Hertian yu in China has a history that goes back around 9,000 years. Um, in Japan, interestingly enough, they find Fei Choi and their history with that goes back 8,000 years. But Fei Choi itself has never been found in China proper. All the material that they were getting when they started to get it um, came out of northern Burma or Myanmar, as it's called now. There is no Fei Choi in China. Never has been. They haven't discovered any at all. For everyone watching, moving forward, we're going to be discussing specifically Fei Choi or Jadeite Jade. In other words, the focus of this interview will not be nephrite jade. There's a lot of confusion about what constitutes Fei Choi, also called jadeite jade. In an effort to dispel rumors and misconceptions, can you explain what Fei Choi is and maybe the, the problem, for lack of a better word, with calling it jade? If Fei Choi was a, mater- it was a jade-like material, and the Chinese had various criteria of what constituted jade. And so the material that came into the market from Myanmar um, had the properties that they considered it jade, but they immediately knew it was different. And of course, anybody who put a piece on a lapidary wheel would know that it was different. And so in, traditionally in China, they had four different materials that they called jade, the so-called four great jades, which is described in our book. Um, but the nowadays, because of uh, what Damore did, nowadays there's only two of those that are considered to be quote unquote true jades. Um, but they're different materials. They're entirely different materials. Where the problem came in was that Damore was working with the tools of the day. And so he knew that the material we call Fei Choi was different from the Hertian Yu the nephrite, he knew they were different, and so he coined a new term for them. He, he coined the term nephrite, which was in general use for that particular type of stone, lapis nephriticus, I think it was the older term, um, stone of the loins or stone of the kidneys. Um, so he coined a new term, which he called jadeite, but our, our latest research shows that Within a year or two of his article, he definitely knew that in China the stone was called Fei Choi. Um, but in any event, he coined the term jadeite, and that's the name that stuck. What he didn't understand was that it was actually an aggregate of different minerals. Now we fast forward to the early years in the 20th century, the 1910, 1920, 1930, Mineralogists and geologists 
knew that this was an aggregate of minerals, but that knowledge never made it its way into the gemological world, which is what created the problem that we have today. How did this problem kind of come to light? In gemology, in old school gemology, and I'm pretty old, uh, we always called the stone jadeite. And that's what all the gemology books call it, including our, our most recent book. In the beginning of the book, we refer to it as a pyroxene jade, and we, and we say explicitly, if you see the word jadeite, we're referring to a pyroxene jade. And if you see the word nephrite, we're referring to an amphibole jade, and that's how we separate them. The problem really, became, really came about because Gem Labs started to get more advanced equipment, and particularly with the Raman spectrophotometer that is now commonplace in many labs, they started to test stones, and they found that some of the quote-unquote jadeites showed spectra that indicated that they were oomphocyte or even cosmochlor. And so being scientists, they do what scientists do, and they want to divide and subdivide and subdivide. And so they, they said, well, we need, to, we need to test for this. What they didn't understand, and what Kaylin will explain in a moment, is that their instruments are not necessarily giving them accurate information. The instruments that most gem labs use only test a small area of the material. So if that area that they happen to test is mainly composed of jade art or mfosat cosmochlor, then that's the spectrum that they're going to get. And that's the general identification that they're going to assign to the material. But there's a lot of factors involved when testing a mineral aggregate compared to testing a single crystal gemstone like ruby, sapphire, emerald, uh, where you can generally trust the spot reading, so to speak, that you take anywhere on the stone, um, barring any significant zoning. Um, but with a mineral aggregate, basically a rock like Fei Choi, um, you, you can't treat it in the same way. You have to if you really want to be certain about what the composition of the material is, you have to analyze everything in it, every single grain. Now, there's ways to analyze the surface of the material with spectroscopy doing mapping across the stone. Um, and that still has its own limitations, but that doesn't mean the center of the stone is going to be the same as the surface of the stone. So you'd have to destroy the sample, powder it, and analyze that powder, which obviously defeats the purpose. Of, of having the, the material. Um, when you running a spectrum, a Raman spectrum or something like that on a stone, the laser size might be too large, um, might overcome more than one mineral grain. So you're going to get the dominant uh, signal from that area that you're measuring. So if there's 50% of those minerals that you're analyzing are emphasites and 50% of them are jadeites, you'll get, you're going to get a spectrum that's uh, intermediate between jadeite and emphasites. Also keeping in mind that each mineral grain can have a, can be a solid solution between jadeite, emphasite and cosmochlor because they're related mem members. So you can have an individual grain that's theoretically 50% jadeite and 50% emphasite. So it's very complicated to try and quantitatively test Fei Choi. It's better to qualitatively test it and prove that one of the Fei Choi minerals, so to speak, at least one of them is present in the material and that's significant enough to call it Fei Choi. Uh, but trying to quantify the exact amounts, is, it's irrelevant and it's, it's not practically possible without destroying the sample. And that brings me to my next question. Is it even important at all to discuss this with the customer who's purchasing the Fei Choi? Do they need to know if there's omphocyte in it? No, they don't need to know because the same material that they've been buying, the material hasn't changed. It's the naming of it that, that has changed. And you know, as technology evolves and our knowledge of gems evolve, so much the, nom so much the nomenclature of the material. So... It's, it's completely irrelevant whether it's test as dominant umphosite or test as dominant jadeite because 
you're always going to be limited by the testing methods, just like the more was t- limited in when he was separating nephrites in, in what's called jadeites. He was, he was limited by the technology at the time. So we are always going to be limited by the technology at the time. So the description that we give is going to be based on the, the technology and the resources available at the time. Of, of testing the material. When you're building a definition, you try to build something that is scientifically accurate, number one, and calling a specimen that is a rock jadeite is not scientifically accurate. As Edward Liu pointed out in his YouTube video, which I urge everyone to watch, um, a piece of marble is not the same as calcite. Calcite's a mineral, marble is a rock. In the same way in the gem world, lazurite is a mineral, but lapis lazuli is the rock. They're not the same. You can't treat them the same. It's actually scientifically um, incorrect to take something like a, a fechoid gem and call it jadeite because you can't really determine that. It's not, a, it's not a single crystal, and it's not an end member. It's a rock. It's probably fair to say that if a customer were to send the same Fei Choi stone to a lab, they might get one result, and then they could send it to a different lab, and get another result, and then send it to a different lab, and get another result. And it might really confuse the customer. Is, is my piece jadeite jade? Is it omphacite jade? Is it jadeite omphacite jade? What is the solution? To that problem obviously labs might differ in opinions like on origin because that's based on a lot of different factors and there's a lot of overlap but what's different with identifying and the nomenclature behind a, a material is that you know if you have different testing methods or, or parameters criteria obviously the potential is there for to yield different results so if you're testing procedure is do three four five spots on the stone with uh with a normal raman spectro- uh, spectrometer that has a larger um, laser size and you just go you know whatever the majority is you're gonna get different results so obviously you're someone who might go in depth and map out the, the entire stone both of which are are irrelevant if you're trying to um, analyze what the end member percentages are in the material, but for sure you there's a potential for for different uh, identifications, so to speak. Yeah, I mean the question is how many spots are enough? Um, and as Edward Liu has pointed out very clearly, right. um, even if you map the entire surface using a Raman spectroscopy, it's still not enough. Um, and Kaylin, you want to talk about his images? Yeah, yeah. So in my article, um, Edward allowed us to reuse these images of backscattered electron images uh, of a Fei Choi specimen example. And um, you know, he found that the deep, the more you zoom in, the, the deeper you dive into the material, the more you understand how complex the intermixture is between the materials. That down to several microns which are like thousands of a millimeter there's complex intermixing of the material so measuring a spot that's one millimeter across you can have thousands of different grains within there that could all be different let's talk a little bit about single crystal omphacite which i know wouldn't like occur you wouldn't have a gemstone that's single crystal omphacite but i think this is what the gemology world really needs to understand right now. What color is omphacite? Well, it really depends. Omphacite is largely colored by iron and chromium uh, based on our current understanding. So generally, it's it can range from a very dark, almost black, uh, it was very dark green, almost black, to a, to a very bright green, um, depending on the trace elements in it um, that would be giving its color. Um, but it's not really, you know, that's the current understanding as it is now, you know, they may find umphasite colored by other material, by other, uh, trace elements, 
um, of different colors in the future. Um, so I don't think it can be one. I think, I th- it, it, and I don't quote me on this necessarily, but it, my understanding is that umphasite is idiochromatic yeah. and that the iron is a basic part of its composition and the iron creates the color. So you're not going to have a colorless umphasite. It's going to be varying shades of green depending on how much it's diluted in the case of Fei Choi by the other minerals that are present. Cosmochlor, I believe, is the chromium um, yeah. pyroxene. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm guessing here, I'm going out on a limb a little bit, but I'm guessing that if you didn't have any Cosmochlor in the stone, the stone would not be green. Um, <gasps> Ooh. And it's the mixture of the three that creates the various colors that you see. And there are secondary colors like the brown and reddish and yellow jades that come from the skin of boulders. Um, those are mechanically colored by natural staining. But when we're talking about the material that doesn't have that kind of staining, um, jadeite is allochromatic. It can be many different colors, but if it's pure, It's colorless. And a few years ago, um, they found some pieces of single crystal jadeite. I've been trying to get my hands on one of them to no avail. Uh, You will see this most often in lavender jade, where the crystals tend to be far more coarse. And and, um, you can see the individual crystals sometimes with the naked eye. In fact, we have a photograph of one of those in our book where you can clearly see the individual grains. So if the grain is colorless, well, then you know that that's jadeite, right? Because it's, it's allochromatic, it's colored by impurities. But if you see, uh, if, if you have cosmochlor or omphocyte, those are self-colored in the same way that a spessartine garnet is self-colored. It's, It's colored by um, manganese, which is part of its chemical composition. Turquoise is self-colored. It's colored by copper. Take away the copper in turquoise, it's no longer turquoise. If you take away the chromium from cosmochlor, it's no longer cosmochlor. If you took the iron out of umphocyte, it would no longer be umphocyte. So those are self-colored minerals. Um, They're termed idiochromatic uh, in the mineralogy and gemology world. But jadeite is allochromatic. It's colorless if it's pure. Although jadeite is allochromatic, um, that doesn't mean that if you see a green green grain, that's automatically cosmochlor, because you do get jadeite that contains chromium in, in trace elements enough to give it a green color, but not enough to consider it cosmochlor. Yeah, I mean, a, a pyrope garnet, which we all know is a red garnet, it is actually allochromatic. If you had a pure pyrope, it would be colorless. Now, why is it never colorless? Because of the almondine that mixes into it. In the single crystal, it's a solid solution mixture. And so you have the same thing. That's what Kalen's trying to say. You have the same thing um, in a jadeite crystal. Within each crystal, you can have a solid solution between other end members, just like the garnets. Kalen, in your article, you really eloquently described this sort of mismatch between gemology and geology and how they don't necessarily transliterate. Can you sort of explain that to our viewers? Um, so the difference between, I would prefer to say, gemology and mineralogy is um, gemology is, uh, well, mineralogy is purely scientific. You know, it's it's there to analyze the material and classified based on strict mineralogical definitions. The International Mineralogical Association is the the ruling body that that makes the final decisions on what is considered what, and generally the mineralogical community accepts these. Um, In gemology, there's two factors. It's the scientific factor, but there's also the commercial factor. And ultimately, gemology has to also answer to commercial interests in mineralogy a ruby a ruby and sapphire are not are not accepted terms those are varietal names varietal names are not accepted so in in uh, mineralogy red corundum 
is it's, it's corundum. Um, but in gemology, we call that ruby because there's commercial importance over whether something is a ruby or a sapphire. So just like with Fei Choi or with Jade, um, calling something, even if it is completely, you somehow determine it was completely umfasat or completely jade art, um, it, it's not really scientifically defensible to, to call it that without destroying the sample, but it's not relevant to the client. The client needs to know that, yes, this is a pyroxene jade. It's the same material that's been called jade art for um, hundreds of years. Um, but Fei Choi is the almost varietal name of that rock, just like lapis lazuli is a varietal name of, of a rock containing lazurite, calcite, and pyrite. So there's definitely a difference between gemology and gemological definitions and mineralogy and mineralogical definitions. If salespeople in jewelry stores start saying Fei Choi Jade, as opposed to Jadeite Jade, or trying to explain the difference between principally Jadeite and principally Omphasite Jade in this whole complicated like world of things, what does the customer need to understand about the hardness and toughness of Fei Choi? When we were investigating the, the hardness of Fei Choi, um, we had very... St- um, similar problems that we had when trying to identify in members because it's a mineral aggregate. So there's so many more factors involved when trying to test the the hardness of a of a polycrystalline material compared to a single crystal material. Um, starting off with a single crystal material, almost every single crystal uh, will have some level of differential hardness. That is across the different crystal faces, they will have some slightly different uh, hardnesses. Um, but some some materials like kyanite have a large difference between hardnesses on different crystal faces. Um, so even within a single crystal of, uh, of jadeite, on the different crystal faces, you can have slightly different hardnesses. And... Um, there's important differentiation to make between what is hardness and what is scratch resistance. So in gemology, what when you talk about hardness, generally people are talking about Mohs scale of hardness. And what it really is, is it's it's scratch resistance. It's it's the gem's resistance to being scratched by a material of known uh, scratch resistance or, or hardness. Hardness is the resistance to deformation or, or to damage and that's generally related to the the bond strength within the material so how difficult is it to break those chemical bonds uh, diamond has a very uh, unique bonding system uh, tetrahedrally bonded carbon atoms and the way it's formed makes it very difficult to break those bonds and that's why it's the hardest naturally occurring material in the world Depending on the, the chemical composition and the structure of a material, um, the difficulty in breaking those chemical bonds uh, will change. That's why gems have different um, Mohs scratch resistance or Mohs, hard, or Mohs hardness. Scratch resistance also incorpor- so incorporates hardness, but it also incorporates something called fracture toughness. So how easily does that material fracture? And... Um, um, and h- hardness is actually elastic uh, deformation. So when you uh, break a bond, does it so does it come back, uh, or is it does it stay broken? So you get inelastic and, and elastic deformation. So both those and fracture toughness are major contributing factors when you're talking about scratch resistance because hardness really, if you're talking about indentation hardness, is what we measured uh, what we measured in the paper is that using a method like Vickers or Noop or something like that is they use a a diamond uh, tip and they indent it into the sample and they measure the size of that indentation and from that they draw conclusions and, and draw a hardness of uh, a, a micro indentation hardness with and that's that's an absolute hardness value that's a number that you get out like 1342 that is the hardness at that load but with scratch resistance, it's a 
it's a relative hardness measurement. So you, you're measuring, is this harder than that? Because can this resist deformation by, by that, for example? So um, that's already the complex system involved. We've been testing single crystals. With a polycrystalline material, each grain can have its own slight resistance to, to damage even if it's all the same material because of differential hardness on the different crystal faces. So if you have just theoretically a piece of fade choy that's 100% jade out on the surface, you can still have different hardnesses from grain to grain if they orientated differently. And that's why you often see on the magnification uh, what's called an orange peel effect, where the, where the surface is not, is not very s smooth and even. There's like humps along the along the surface, accounting for the differential hardness between the different grains. Yeah, lapidaries call that undercutting. Um, and you, you frequently see it in the lower, lower grades of Fei Choi. And then when it comes to the toughness of Fei Choi, I, I feel like customers often ask, well, can I wear this every single day? Is it going to break easily? And that's always a very tricky question because there is this huge range in toughness when it comes to Fei Choi. Because Fei Choi has, and, and Nefrat, um, have interlock, interlocking structures, um, it makes them very, very tough. And that's why they're good for carving. Um, you can carve away at a piece and it's not going to just fracture through the, the entire material because the interlocking, interlocking structure keeps it stable, so to speak, and the granular nature, you know, if you fracture one grain, because it's not directly co connected to the next grain, that's where the fracture stops. So you can break off, essentially, small grains at a time and carve the material, and it's very, very tough. As Richard said earlier, um, jade in China has been used for 9,000 years. And I don't know if specifically if they've, if they've found 9,000-year-old jade, but there's, there's jade that they found from thousands of years ago that's still intact. Um, and that speaks to the durability of the material. I was taught a very important lesson by a friend of mine many years ago. He had a boulder of Fei Choi sitting on the floor of his workshop. And, and he... I don't know how the subject came up, but he said, you know, jade is really tough. And I said, yeah, it's tough, but, you know, anything can be broken. And so he said, knock yourself out. Here's a hammer. Go ahead and break it. And so I took the hammer. It was a good-sized hammer, and I was like Paul Bunyan, right? Bang! And the only thing that broke was my arm you know, rattling off the surface. The jade itself was untouched. Nephrite is actually tougher than, than Fei Choi. Um, nephrite is the toughest natural material known to man. But both materials are exceedingly difficult to break. Now, that said, from a jewelry standpoint, can you break a piece of Fei Choi? Absolutely. There may be fissures in the stone that are, there may be inherent weaknesses in different places. You will frequently see bangle bracelets that have broken because um, the way people are moving their hands around, it's easy to bang it against something. And so uh, it's not indestructible, but it's exceedingly tough. And the consumer can be told that. It's very, very tough, but for any gemstone, um, you need to take care of it. Obviously, uh, regarding the hardness, because both Fei Choi and Nephrite are less than seven in hardness, the hardest component of the dust in the air is quartz. And so any gem that is softer than quartz, if you wipe the dust off of it enough times, you'll put micro scratches on it, it'll eventually lose its polish. Um, but that's true for any gemstone that's softer than quartz, including some very expensive gems like opal and tanzanite, and there, there are many, many others. So you should take good care of your jewelry of all types. Um, don't consider it to be indestructible. 
But in terms of uh, hardness and toughness, it's a wonderful gem material. Is it fair to say that Fei Choi Jade really is it's simple as far as the customer and even the retail seller is concerned? Nothing has changed in regards to what should be sold as jade or how to test it. General care in, in wearing jade is the same. <laughs> We're not changing the rules just because of, you know, some variances in hardness. Um, what, what needs to change is the categorization of omphacite jade, which is currently sort of separate from jade eye jade at the laboratory level. Uh, specifically like on customer reports. If somebody were to spend maybe a lot of money on a stone and then send it to a lab, the report that they get back from that lab might be really confusing. What is Lotus Gemology doing to sort of set the example for the trade as far as food choy laboratory reports are concerned? Well, we have on our on our report, we have a, a very simple statement that is Fei Choi is the traditional Chinese term for a pyroxene jade. It may be a combination of jadeite, umphacite, and cosmochlor. And so you can consider fei choy to be a syn synonym of pyroxene jade. It is a more accurate term than calling something jadeite it's scientifically and mineralogically more accurate. The, in, the, in the mineralogical and geologic world, they don't call this rock jadeite. They call it jadeite or... Umphysatite. <laughs> which I can never pronounce. Or... Cosmochlorite. Cosmochlorite. So they don't even call these things jadeite. In the, in the geologic world um, because they know they're rocks. And the, the geologic world and the mineralogical world, as I mentioned earlier, they've known this since the 1920s. But that information never really made it into the gemological realm until somebody put a piece on their Raman spectrometer and got a reading that they interpreted as being different from the mineral species jadeite, and that's what caused the problem. So we're trying to fix the problem. We think the solution, which has, it's not our solution, it's been adopted in China and Hong Kong. They've had numerous meetings, some of which I've attended over a decade, and they've adopted this nomenclature because it makes sense. It makes scientific sense. It also makes cultural sense. As Edward Liu points out in his, um, in his video, culture matters. Taking a piece of fish and putting it on rice that's wrapped with seaweed, okay, and describing it as rice with fish and seaweed is not the same as sushi. There is a culture here. And so fei choy is the traditional term in China and it works much better than the incorrect uh, nomenclature to call something jadeite or umphacite, in our opinion. Mr. Hughes, your book, Jade, A Gemologist's Guide, came at a fantastic time for me and my career in jade. But I'd love to ask if you think it came at the right time for the whole industry as well. My jade friends and I all optimistically believe that jade interest is on the rise that more customers are recognizing this rare and exotic stone for how incredible it really is. You have more of an international perspective. Do you think jade demand is growing? And what do you think is in the near future for our industry? As the Danish physicist Niels Bohr famously said, predictions are difficult, especially regarding the future. I don't know what's going to happen going forward. But I do believe that there will be more interest in jade as a gem material because it is such a, it has so much more um, aspects to it than an ordinary gemstone. I was telling Kaylin the other day that in my library here at home, I have two shelves that are devoted to books on ruby and sapphire. 
It fits on roughly two shelves. I have about 15 or 20 shelves of books on jade. It is such a bigger subject area because it's not just a gemstone, um, but for all the cultures where jade was found, it was always considered the most valuable material. In China, in athletic competitions, the winner does not get a gold medal. They get a jade medal. Jade was always reserved for first place in athletic competitions. When, uh, I think it was Cortez, went to the New World and conquered the Aztec capital, which is now Mexico City, um, supposedly Montezuma said to his people, uh, thank God they don't care about the jade. They don't understand the jade. Because for them, that was the most valuable material. Wherever jade has been found in the world, it was always considered the most valuable material, probably because in the Neolithic period, they had a material that could be made into weapons and axes and things like that. It would retain its, its structure um, over long periods of time, unlike any other material, you can't just take a piece of granite and grind it as an axe head and use it as an axe. Even if you make a sharp edge on it, it's going to break. Um, it's not going to work. Jade was the one material that had that property of toughness. And then it also later became a symbol of royalty, of the emperor, of, of leadership. And so the leaders kept that material for themselves, the best material for themselves. Um, that's where the term, the Western term, imperial jade, comes from, was the idea that in the uh, palace in Beijing, um, the emperor had first pick of the best material. And our term, imperial jade, actually was coined by a, a French ceramic expert in the 19th century, he compared the color of Fei Choi, the green color of Fei Choi, to the bright green colors in the imperial ceramics. And there are certain colors that were reserved for the emperor in clothing and also in ceramics. And that's why he referred to the material as imperial jade. Should we stop saying omphasite jade in the trade? I think we both agree that we should stop using that term. You can say umfasad rich fei choi jade, but it's only really for if you're talking about, it's not, not, not to go on a report. On a report, it should just be fei choi. In the case of like the Chinese market, it seems like they distinguish black umfasite almost separately from fei choi. Like they usually call it umfasite, which you don't hear in American jewelry stores. And I think one of the reasons that that black umfasite is prized is because when they take a pen light and they shine a light through it, it glows this really bright green. Is it fair to say though that we don't know for certain that those are principally umfasite just because they're black and have the, the green glow? You cannot say what something really is because you can't destroy the specimen and that's how you would have to determine what it is. But the term Fei Choi is used as an umbrella term in China and Hong Kong. Um, and you will see in, in books, for example, Mimi Yang, who is like the godmother of Jay science, um, and she's an extremely important figure. In, in one of her books, which is called Fei Choi, A Stone and a Culture, she clearly talks about black Fei Choi, green Fei Choi of various types, red Fei Choi, yellow Fei Choi. It's all Fei Choi. So, um, and that's what the, the trade has decided in Hong Kong and in China. And as Kaylin told me last week, in Hong Kong, it's actually part of the law. There's actually a, a government regulation which specifies um, what you can call jade. And that term, Fei Choi, is used for all colors and also if the stone is treated. In the case of a sapphire, you have a natural sapphire. In the Fei Choi world, that would be called a type A sapphire. Then you have some sapphires that are diffusion treated. 
It's still sapphire. In the Fei Choi world, if it's been bleached and impregnated, that's called type B. And, the, and then you, have, you can have a dyed sapphire. Well, that's type C Fei Choi. So we don't change the name of the material based on the treatment. Uh, the name is still Fei Choi in the same way that a sapphire is still a sapphire, a ruby is a ruby, an emerald still an emerald even if it's oiled, which most of them are. We don't stop calling it emerald because it's oiled. I, I just one further point I want to mention is regarding the book. I was I was the editor of the book. I I uh, authored or co-authored several chapters, but this was a team effort of 25 experts, um, each of whom made important contributions. And I want to single out uh, Roland Schlussel of Pillar and Stone because he really uh, pushed to have the book be published. And then Roland was also always saying, go big, go big. Let's not limit ourselves to something small. Let's, let's make it everything it can be um, because there is no book describing the gemology of jade, no modern book anyway. Uh, and so that's what we tried to achieve with the book, thanks to the help of many, many experts from around the world.